वेलकम डियर स्टूडेंट्स टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर के एस नागराजा ऑफ डेकन कॉलेज पुणे टीचिंग द कोर्स ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल लिंग्विस्टिक्स इन द टूडेज मॉड्यूल ऑन साउंड चेंजर्स इट्स कैरेक्टरिस्टिक फीचर्स वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द नेचर ऑफ साउंड इन अ लैंग्वेज एंड नॉट ओनली दैट how sound change in due course of time what type of changes take place because uh, there are basic two theories of changes sound changes so th all these things will be discussed in this particular module so in order to describe how a language has developed over a given span of time we require a theoretical framework or model within which the facts may be stated and explained ideally such a model should be capable of accounting for all the changes which have taken place in the language by reducing them to a systematically integrated set of rules any particular phenomenon will then be considered as explained if we can state it in terms of these rules among the three models which are available for description the new grammarian model which was the earliest will be taken up first in this section the new grammarian model still constitutes the essential foundation upon which both the structuralist also known as taxonomic and the transformation generative models were erected the first one actually is the neo grammarians it is a so called neo grammarians a group of indo europeanists who came to be known as young grammaticers in german working at or in association with the university of leipzig during the last decades of the 19th century who are credited with putting historical linguistics onto a scientific footing for the first time because they explicitly formulated the methodological principles and theoretical postulates which guided their work and put them to practical test in order to systematically account for the phenomenon of language change the new grammarians found it necessary to postulate two fundamental principles governing the development of language through time namely sound change and analogy analogy is also called gramma grammar oriented change the general position from which the neo grammarians approach their subject was the assumption that languages change must have order and thus be amenable to systematic investigation they based their expectations that language development is rule governed on certain universal aspects of language itself namely the use by human beings for purposes of communication the uniform way in which it is transmitted from one generation to another is production by means of a common articulatory apparatus as well supports this claim since language is essentially a human activity it was argued that the guiding principles for the study of its evolution should be sought within the general rules that govern human behavior the most important characteristics of his sound change are regularity because of the regularity is known as regularity hypothesis and irreversibility they claim that sound changes are very different from other language changes in that they operate mechanically and regularly without any exceptions <laughs>
there is some changes can only be conditioned by phonetic factors and not by grammatical lexical or semantic factors the postulation of this hypothesis concerning the nature of sound change completely revolutionized the study of diachronic aspects of language it made that study highly systematic though there were severe criticisms of this hypothesis but two important generalizations that form the basis of the hypothesis appear to have stood the test of time they are the regularity of sound change and the irreversibility of sound change the second one is the regularity of sound change sound changes are considered to be regular in that they affect the whole paradigm of the sounds involved as such they can only be con conditioned by phonetic factors that is sound changes directly affect sounds and not individual words they affect words only indirectly because of the fact that the sounds that change had occurred in those words consider the change of sanskrit sha to sa in saurasani prakrit it concerns a change in the pronunciation of the sound the speakers of the language at an earlier stage were able to produce three different sibilants sa sha and sha but at a particular period in the history of that language they stopped differentiating between sa and sha and started using only one sibilant namely sa as a result of this change every single word that earlier contained the sound sha now came to be pronounced with the sound sa so we we have the words here uh saras in sanskrit becomes sara shara or uh, means arrow in sanskrit becomes sara the the palatal changes to alveolar similarly sapta and uh, uh the other one we can see changes of this type take place at the acquisitional stage of language when a new generation of speakers acquire as uh, as earlier form of prakrit that is a kind of old prakrit they fail to acquire the distinction between the two sibilants and as a result the sound change got introduced into their system since it was a change in the pronunciation of the relevant sounds and not of the words in which the sounds occur as such its effect on those words was complete another interesting observation that supports the regularity hypothesis is that sound changes that affect a sound partially that is conditioned sound changes leave behind morphophonic alternations that make the grammar of the language even more complex for instance sanskrit had undergone at an earlier stage a merger of two sounds that is ta and da in the word final position the two sounds however were kept distinct in other positions like word initial and intervocal as a result stems contain a final da came to show two different forms one with a final ta when no suffix followed them and two with a final da when a suffix with an in initial vowel followed them these alternating forms contrast with forms that do not show any comparable alternation because they already possess a final th that was th even when a fix suffix with an initial vowel followed as illustrated below 
So the words here, the, the first type uh, in uh, instrument, uh, in the nominative forms like sharat means autumn, sharada in the instrumental case by autumn. You can see ta changes to da. Similarly, sampat, sampada, vipat, vipada. But in the second section, second type, you see there is no change. Marut means wind becomes maruta in the instrumental by the wind. Similarly, sarit, sarita, jagat, jagata. So it may be noted that the regularity occurring in the effects of a given sound change can be disturbed by changes that take place later in the language. Borrowings from a neighboring language or from earlier records of the same language can also introduce words that contain the lost sound in the relevant environments. For example, Kannada, a Dravidian language, has completely changed an initial pa to ha. This change probably becomes visible starting from around 10th century AD and by 15th century most of the vocabulary with pa had changed into ha like uh, some instances like palu becoming halu milk puli becomes huli tiger palli palli becoming halli village etc it later borrowed words like uh, purva east papa sin patana city etc from sanskrit kannada also borrowed words like padu suffering pade army pitta bile etc from its own earlier stage these now appear as exceptions to the regularity of the change of initial pa to ha another example can be provided from hindi in which the regularity of the effects of an earlier sasha merger has been disturbed by borrowings from sanskrit in the first type uh, some instances are given wherein uh, we have uh, hindi forms inherited from the earlier stages sanskrit prakrit etc so for instance uh, shiras means head in sanskrit becomes uh, sira in prakrit and in hindi it becomes sir shata hundred becomes sata in prakrit and sau in hindi dasha ten becomes dasa in prakrit das in hindi like this you can one can see many however borrowed words that is directly from sanskrit we can see in uh, hindi retain that sound shura of sanskrit means valiant uh, though becomes changes to sura in prakrit uh, it uh, but in hindi it is sure it is actually taken from sanskrit that's why sure the palatal uh, fricative is there similarly destruction nasha nasa in prakrit nash in Hindi. Shapa, curse in Sanskrit, which becomes Sava in Prakrit, but it comes back to Hindi as Shap. Similarly, Desha in Sanskrit means country, it changes to Desa in Prakrit, but it becomes Desh in Hindi. Another principle is irreversibility of sound change. The second generalization connected with the regularity hypothesis is that sound changes are irreversible. Once a sound change has taken place, its effects upon the grammar and lexicon are so numerous and scattered that it cannot be reversed 
through any of the following sound changes or other types of language changes. It might be possible to bring back into the language some of the lexical distinctions that have been lost by such changes as for example by borrowing words from neighboring dialects or from earlier stages of the same language. Now we look at some of the objections raised by various scholars against the regularity hypothesis. The most consistent criticism that has been leveled against the regularity hypothesis has come from dialectologists. Their arguments are mainly based upon the fact that dialect studies do not confirm any of the corollaries that can be derived from the regularity hypothesis. For example, the hypothesis makes one expect that a dialect study would show sharp and clear cut boundaries between two different dialects of which one has undergone a given sound change and the other one has not. The fallacy of this argument lies in the underlying assumptions of expectation itself. The dialectologists were wrong in expecting that dialect boundaries would be sharply demarcated. After all, the regularity hypothesis does concede the possibility of dialectal borrowing interfering with the effects of a given sound change. If the communities speaking two different dialects have close social contacts in the border areas, for instance, they cannot fail to show mutual borrowings. Since borrowings affect lexical items individually, they would have the effect of producing the illusion that each lexical item has a different kind of spread concerning a sound that has affected the dialect. This will clearly explain the haziness or confusion in the phonetic correspondences of items that have been recorded in border areas. It is also conceivable that a sound change affecting a particular generation would not generally form a sharply demarcating future between two succeeding generations. Mutual borrowings would exist between two such generations as it exists between two adjacent communities. The general effect of such borrowings would be the normally observed appearances of a change affecting a lexicon gradually. That is, if we examine the records of a language stretching through one or two centuries, we would find that the number of lexical items that show the, eff the effects of a given sound change increases gradually from one decade to the next. For example, it has been claimed that the change of initial pa to ha in Kannada has taken about five centuries to completely affect the Kannada lexicon. This claim is based upon the fact that the Kannada inscriptions show fewer words that have been affected by this change in the 10th century as compared to the 11th or 12th centuries. The number of such words increases as we proceed up to the 15th century. Since borrowing from the speech of persons belonging to the previous generation can be the basis of this fact, it might be a mistake to regard it as indicating the irregular or gradual occurrences of the sound change itself. Another feature is called uh, another objection for this exceptions to regularity. Effects of borrowing is one of them. As mentioned above, borrowings of lexical items from neighboring languages or dialects that have not undergone a given sound change can be the cause of 
some of the exceptions that we observe while studying the effects upon a given language or dialect. There may be a couple of exceptions to regularity hypothesis. That is one of them is due to effects of borrowing. As mentioned above, borrowings of lexical items from neighboring languages or dialects that have not undergone a given sound change can be the cause of some of the exceptions that we observe while studying the effects upon a given language or dialect. The problem is to separate inherited items from such borrowed items. One interesting characteristic of borrowed items that can be helpful in this context is that borrowings generally do not affect basic lexical items. Even among non-basic items, they affect nouns more readily than verbs. If a language shows the effects of a sound change in most of its basic and functional words, but not in many of the non-basic words, we can assume that the exceptions to the sound change occurring in words of the latter type are the results of borrowings. For example, exceptions to the claim that Hindi has changed Sanskrit sha to sa are found most commonly in non-basic lexical items but rarely in basic items. Most of these exceptions can therefore be explained as resulting from the fact that Hindi has borrowed those words from Sanskrit after the sound change had taken place in it. Such borrowings from an earlier stage of a language can occur more readily if that earlier form of the language continues to be used for literary purposes as has happened in the case of Sanskrit. Sanskrit sh changed to Hindi sa in basic that is inherited words like uh, the present data shows dasha becoming das, vimshati becomes bis, shiras becoming sir, shata becoming sau, etc. However, Sanskrit sh retained as Hindi sh in non-basic words that is the borrowed words shura becoming shur, yesha becoming yesh, shapa becoming shap etc. So indicate that is uh, the, the fact that the borrowed words are uh, can retain or can innovate some of the sounds of the earlier stage. Another interesting point is that inherited items would be more numerous in the central part of the given language or dialect areas than in its peripheral parts. Hence, if the exceptions of a particular type to a given sound change are more numerous in the peripheral part of a language area rather than in its central part, we can conclude that they are due to borrowing. For example, Kannada shows a greater number of borrowings from Marathi in Belagam, which is adjacent to the Marathi speaking area than in Shumuga, which is located in the central part of the language area. Further, the kinds of borrowings that we find in these peripheral areas would also be different as they would depend upon the kinds of languages that are spoken in the adjacent areas. In the above instance of Kannada, for example, there are more borrowings from Telugu than from Marathi in Balari, which is adjacent to a Telugu speaking area. Thus, sound changes introduce regularity from the phonetic point of view but as a result, they may create irregularity in grammatical paradigms. Grammar-oriented changes, on the other hand, remove irregularity from the point of view of paradigms, but as a result, 
they may in introduce irregularity into phonetic correspondences. Sound changes are motivated by the nature of sounds whereas grammar oriented changes are motivated by the nature of alternations. The effect of the former on alternations is unmotivated, it is only an effect whereas the effect of the latter on sounds is motivated. A few more irregularities could be accounted for invoking to onomatopoeia and phonetic symbolism. A few examples are provided here. There is probably little evidence to argue that phonetic symbolism resists sound change. Regarding instances of onomatopoeia as seen in Canada, have highly restricted structures and have certain constraints. Exceptions to sound change can also be introduced by hypercorrection in languages. One very good example is from Canada can be discussed. Another type of change belonging to this type is sporadic changes as stated at the beginning itself. They are considered to differ from regular sound changes on a number of additional aspects. Sporadic changes are generally of the type that can as well be termed as speech lapses. They are quite frequently affected by sounds at a distance. Dissimulation is as frequent as assimilation. Metathesis and the dropping of syllables is quite common. Their field is mostly restricted to a few consonants such as liquids, nasals or sibilants and they typically occur at the time in which a community is using a language rather than the time in which a generation is acquiring it. Sporadic changes in many cases provide explanations to some of the apparent exceptions to sound change. In fact, they strengthen the regularity hypothesis by accounting for a few more cases of irregularity that occur in the sets of correspondences that represent a given sound change. Another major hypothesis of sound change is what is called gradualness hypothesis. That means uh, the change, the sound change is supposed to be gradual. Linguists differ rather widely regarding the exact connotation that they assign to the term gradualness. It has also been used rather indiscriminately to indicate at least four different aspects of sound change. First, phonetic gradualness. Some linguists consider the gradualness of sound change to be phonetic. They expect it to affect sounds only in several small imperceptible steps. For example, they would assume the change of A to E in a language to have taken place through a number of discrete steps, each represented by a slight rise in tongue height, the whole process taking decades or maybe even centuries to attain completion. The main basis of this contention is the remarkable regularity of sound changes. It has been argued that the changes could not be so regular if they were not unnoticeable. The above argument is based upon the contention that if the changes were noticeable, they would be affected by non-phonetic interferences such as those of meaning, grammatical function and so on. A case of gradual phonetic change is considered to be observable in the Indo-Aryan languages. The loss of single intervocalic stops in the modern Indo-Aryan languages is considered to have taken place through several intervening stages.
वन वॉइसिंग टू स्पिरटिजाइजेशन थ्री डिडक्शन टू वीकली आर्टिकुलेटेड यर व एंड फोर कंप्लीट लॉस एविडेंस फॉर ईच ऑफ दीज स्टेजेस इज कंसिडर टू बी अवेलेबल इन द रिकॉर्ड्स ऑफ मिडल इंडो आरियन लैंग्वेजेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल संस्कृत कृत डन बिकम्स इन इन सौरसेन प्राकृत किड इन निया प्राकृत कृध एंड देन इन महाराष्ट्र प्राकृत किया ऑन द फ्यूचर ऑफ ग्रेजुअलनेस इज इंडिविजुअल ग्रेजुअलनेस अकॉर्डिंग टू सम स्कॉलर्स ए गिवन साउंड चेंज would be introduced into the language by one or two individuals to start with it would then be gradually borrowed by more and more individuals as they come into contact either directly or indirectly with the innovating individuals as a result of this borrowing of innovations from one individual to another sound changes are assumed to spread out like a wave in the social temporal and geographical spheres then the question of direction of sound change while describing or classifying different types of sound changes we generally make use of pairs of opposing terms such as assimilation dissimulation elision addition monophonization diaphonization split or merger and so on the use of such opposing terms can be rather misleading because it creates the impression that sound changes can be bidirectional yeah however a closer examination of the actual sound changes that get classified under these opposing terms indicate that they generally involve different types of environments for example a mid vowel is raised and turned into a high vowel in kannada when followed by a high vowel whereas a high vowel is lower to a mid vowel in telugu when followed by a low vowel this latter change has also occurred in kannada a front vowel was changed into back vowel in tulu or in sanketi tamil when preceded by a bilabial sound it was actually a case of rounding following followed by backing on the other hand a back vowel was fronted and also made unrounded in simulis when followed by a high front vowel or semi vowel as the following example illustrates but a careful examination of these changes indicates on the whole that the changes are unidirectional we can generally predict the type of change that can affect a given sound by taking into consideration the nature of the sound the changes and the type of environment in which the change occurs it would not be possible however to predict when a change is going to take place or even whether a change is going to take place in a given language that is the prediction is about the type of sound changes that might occur in a given type of environment in summary we may compare the futures of sound change versus other changes sound changes are regular other changes are irregular sound change affects simultaneously all lexical items that qualify whereas other changes can affect different lexical items at different times similarly sound changes operate mechanically that is phonetically only and also it is unobservable whereas other changes 
proceed according to psychological principles. Sound changes take place in gradual impromptu steps whereas other changes may take place in highly perceptible and abrupt quantum leaps. In this chapter some of the important characteristics of sound change has been studied so far. Regularity that is having only phonetic conditioning and irreversibility are the two crucial ones among them. Criticisms level against this derive primarily from the failure to properly differentiate between sound changes and other changes. Borrowings of words from neighboring dialects or languages, grammar oriented changes of sounds, sporadic changes of sounds, hypercorrection and phonetic symbolism are some of these other types of changes that disturb the effects of sound change on sounds and thereby make sound changes look irregular. The effects of these additional changes on sounds should be separated from those of sound changes before we can obtain a correct understanding of sound changes. To summarize this particular module, sound change as proposed by neogrammarians has a great uh, basis and it is highly valid that sound change is regular, irreversible, imperceptible and changes mechanically. Though various scholars have tried to argue out against the hypothesis, so far they have not been successful in their effort. Some of those efforts will be looked at in later modules as well. To begin with, this is a very important module which shows the way sounds can change in languages. Thank you.